said, building uh, the future together, that resonated a lot with me. And I will be talking today about, as you said, inclusion matters, accessibility in the workplace. So what you can do in the workplace. A little bit about me. I'm a people leader in engineering, so I lead um, agile teams, as Lida said. Uh, currently, I have three. And in my freelance work, I consult companies in developer relations, community, a bit of recruiting as well, also write. And uh, currently, I'm giving a lot of talks on various topics, mostly on diversity, inclusion, and accessibility. And you can find me on Twitter under this handle, underscore frenzied. So please tweet, spread the message about uh, today's uh, contents. We need to make the world more accessible. So why am I giving this talk? Why am I uh, here in this uh, round talking about accessibility? I am very open in the fact that I live with chronic illnesses. I have a interesting thing called factor V resistance, which is a rare genetic disorder, uh, which affects the, fa the fifth blood clotting factor. Um, and therefore I have very thick blood and it also leads to a lot of other things. Um, and it's not very well researched and it can basically, a lot of things can happen and we do not know whether it would be due to that or not. I also live with microbiome damage. I'm very open about this as well. In fact, I did talk about some of these aspects while I was job hunting because I firmly believe that uh, there should not be any stigma in living with chronic illnesses, living with disabilities or whatever kind of condition that someone might have. So out of this, this condition, out of these, uh, these um, the stance, I feel that uh, accessibility is very important and we need to encourage accessibility. And I have tried out my uh, approaches and uh, obviously exchanged a lot with people. So this is what I'm going to be talking about today. So before we actually delve into the matter of accessibility in the workplace specifically, um, I would like to briefly introduce what we are actually looking at when we look at sort of this realm of disability which is on the one hand, obviously visible disability, so blind people, um, people who are um, maybe deaf or hard of hearing, uh, motoric disabilities and so forth. Then there are a lot of non-visible disabilities. If you look at me, you wouldn't think that I'm a, a person with a disability. So um, oftentimes we do not really rea realize or recognize that a person has a disability. And interestingly enough, there are also temporary disabilities, which means that Maybe people had surgery and they need to regenerate. There are some conditions that come with that. And that affects a, a very, very large share of the population. And is something that is often not really recognized also in the realm of accessibility. Then we have chronic illnesses, which is a very, very vast spectrum. My favorite people and examples are usually the diabetic people and the asthmatic people because they are very well researched and there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of uh, good, good examples or good takeaways from that. But again, um, I live with a rare chronic illness. And in fact, there's a rare uh, disease day, which is the 29th of February, which is a rare day, uh, coincidentally or not. Um, so there's a wide, wide spectrum of people with conditions and different, um, different uh, challenges they face. And I also want to uh, mention neurodiversity, not because neurodiversity is a disability per se, but it can lead to some mannerisms or needs that need to be accommodated, especially in the workplace, that might not be visible at first glance as well. So neurodiversity usually is associated with people on the autism spectrum, but there's also ADHD, dyslexia, dyscalculia, and sometimes just a little tool can help people a lot in that area. But the fun fact is accessibility is not just for people with disabilities. As I said, some of us have temporary disabilities, but it's for everyone. Accessibility means to design products, devices, services, and environments to be accessible for everyone. And what is an environment? Of course, the workplace, right? This is an environment where we usually spend a lot of time, maybe not in these Corona weeks, where a lot of us in tech are in home office and can do that. Uh, but then again, we need to make sure that the home office is accessible as well. So accessibility in essence makes everything uh, accessible, makes everything usable for people, no matter what kind of condition background or whatever they come with. So to delve into the how, I'm not going to be talking about, let's say, specific tooling, do this, do that, and so forth. But I want, what I want to do is increase your awareness for some of the things that go on around us that might also not be visible at first glance. And to do this, I brought three friends along with me who I will introduce you to shortly. 
One of my first friends is Samira. Samira is a backend developer. And Samira was promoted to senior backend developer at the Singapore SAS provider Calendar Candle. She has been deaf since the age of five. She experienced the severe back pains due to arthrosis, needs time to realign and focus, Choose, chose Calendar Candle specifically because there was already a hard of hearing developer on the staff and finds it challenging to interact with her colleagues at times. So Samira is someone you can meet in the office, could be any, any colleague, and how can you actually help Samira to have a more accessible environment? For example, you could have a sign language interpreter. I don't know how it is in your countries, but in Germany, where I come from, a lot of sign language interpreters are actually paid by the government. They are assistive programs that you can, um, you can leverage and you can make use of so that they can present, let's say, at gatherings and they can comment and support people on the staff. Cell phone. Sounds easy and is actually. Having a cell phone can make a huge difference for Samira. I once co-worked with a deaf developer and he communicated a lot via cell phone. He um, typed in his messages, um, colleagues could type in messages and that was his lifeline basically. For staff who does not necessarily use a cell phone, that can actually make the decisive difference. Of course, subtitles, as this event shows, subtitles are a great way to include people, um, not just because maybe they are hard of hearing, but maybe because they just generally might not have that good of a hearing, or maybe it's, it even helps people to focus. So by supporting Samira, you will already support a lot of other colleagues as well. Workplace setup, especially with her back pain, how can you set up a workplace? Think about that. Sometimes just small switches, having uh, a standing desk or having tools that enable to have a standing desk, um, having her sit in a place where she can see where colleagues are approaching her will already make her much more comfortable. And interestingly enough, there's also this idea of a quiet or medical room. Sometimes the medical room is used uh, as a quiet room. It's a very, very simple thing, but it can change the world for a lot of people just to have the opportunity to go to a quiet space, to relax, to breathe a little bit. Then next up, we have Charlie, who's a community manager. Charlie is lead community manager at London gaming studio Game Buzz. They are a wheelchair user. They are able to walk very short distances though. They have an undisclosed autoimmune disease. They fear the company's activity days. Just thinking about we are going on an excursion will make Charlie run for the hills. Charlie cannot make use of the provided food the company has. And Charlie oftentimes feels lonely as they are the only one in the company who are different or being perceived as different. So how can we support Charlie? Charlie obviously needs an accessible environment. So things like ramps, elevators, handrails, having disabled toilets. Oftentimes it sounds really easy, but when we think about especially buildings where there is a lot of protection in place, that might not be as easy as it sounds. But when you think about renting a new office or thinking about how can you make your office accessible, think about all the ways and means that someone like Charlie who walks very short distances could be supported with that. Then also flexibility in remote working. Corona has shown us that you don't necessarily have to be in the office. Charlie feels the same. For Charlie, just leaving the office sometimes can be a bit more challenging on some days. So having the ability to work at home where they're comfortable, um, where they can also exchange with the colleagues, there is no, um, there's no hurdle because there's a lot of video communication as well. That helps Charlie as well. Having alternative activities on days out. Have you ever seen one of like when you when you go to a job page of a company and then you see that they are mountain climbing on days out? For me, especially, that wouldn't be a thing. And Charlie would be super, super scared of that, right? And not because Charlie is not an active person and not because Charlie doesn't want to be involved. They do. It's simply that sometimes not everybody can do everything, especially when it's um, it requires strong physical um, interaction climbing, walking, etc. So having an alternative activity or having an activity that everyone can do already includes people on such a big scale. And it also, again, includes people that are not necessarily in the situation that Charlie has. 
a simple thing like a survey to ask for food preferences. I know a lot of people, especially people with autoimmune diseases, who have to be very selective about what they eat. And oftentimes it's a bit unfair then that everybody else can eat and they cannot. So uh, just asking what, what is it that you prefer can actually make a huge difference. And if you ask me for a tip, a pseudoallergenic diet is very, very good because it already excludes a lot of allergens. So next up and the third one in our round, the final one in our round is Kwame, who's a technical writer. Kwame recently joined Action, the provider of an accessibility suite in New York. He immigrated to the US to have better working conditions. He's originally from Ghana. He's legally blind, which means that he cannot uh, see, um, he cannot even see contrasts or colors or shapes. He is 100% uh, blind. Occasionally he uses the, com um, I'm sorry, occasionally I should have cut that out. <laughs> he uses obviously the company screen reader a lot and, and all the time. He is, however, supported by colleagues with design reviews because Kwame cannot really see pictures, uh, cannot see pictures at all. So obviously when he publishes an article, he needs support from the colleagues. He's also, however, disappointed that action caters well to his needs, but constantly disregards employees with so-called less severe illnesses. That is what was said at action. And he cannot understand that a provider of an accessibility suite would actually think that. So how can we support Kwame and his colleagues? Screen readers, obviously. Screen reader technology, voice technology, this is what Kwame needs and what can also, again, support a lot of other people, understand, access digital technology, use the technology, use it to, to make their living, to earn their living. But also, if we look at the spectrum apart from the tooling, people who are out, people who are who have an environment where they feel like, yes, I can talk about what condition disability I have, or even if I ha don't have something, but I can talk, I feel comfortable talking with other people about that. Weakness is accepted. And a work environment where people who maybe take a mental day or people who, um, again, don't have severe illnesses, maybe just have an autoimmune disease, which is in itself really strong already and really affecting already, um, this is accepted and it's not seen as a weakness, but it's actually seen as a strength where from which you can draw a lot. Anti-bias training could help reducing biases in the team. And my personal favorite is coaching because by coaching um, employees one-to-one, -one, doing group coachings, you can create an environment where, for example, open, an open feedback culture exists and where people feel comfortable about Again, talking about things that might be perceived as weakness or not be perceived as strength. So to summarize all of that, when we look at toolings and how we can support people in the workplace, there are a lot of tools out there. Again, I'm not going to list every single item, every single tool. But the most important thing, especially as an employer, especially in the workplace, dealing with your colleagues, interacting with them, is mindset. Ask yourself, reflect. Do you perceive a difference between what is normal and what is unusual? How do you perceive people with disabilities and chronic illnesses or having any sort of conditions? How do you talk to them? Oftentimes when we reflect a little bit on that, um, we, first of all, the, the insight comes that we don't have a lot of people um, who are open or who are living openly with these kind of things at our workplace. And it's not because they're not there, it's because a lot of people just don't speak up about it. And I find that a lot of it is also due to the fact that we do make a difference between the normal and the unusual. What I'm trying to say is that if we perceive the sort of unusual or the, 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 the people with disabilities, people with chronic illnesses, as belonging to the normal, as being the normal spectrum, we already change our mindset so much that we will think about accessibility already. We don't even need to have it as an afterthought. So the most important thing is actually heart, having heart, having empathy, embracing your colleagues, um, providing them with the support they need, thinking about the accommodations, supporting them with the accommodations. So this is the biggest and most important tool set you can have. But just to summarize before I finish my talk, I want to give you some tips and then one practical example as well. Don't assume that everyone can eat, do, or practice everything. It's not like that. There will be exceptions. There will be people that are different, that, that just, as I said, cannot go on the excursion, cannot maybe eat all of the food. 
but just don't don't assume just just don't think that oh yeah the, here is it and and everybody can use for that and everybody can can enjoy that even that's another factor as well don't reduce people to their disability i was asked okay i met a person who's in a wheelchair can i ask what they have probably yes but it's a person get to know them with all of their facets they are a multifaceted person like you and me and this is just one thing that they have or that they live with and once they open up once the, the bonding has taken place they will probably tell you a little bit more about themselves including that but it's just one aspect don't negate disability at the same time uh, thinking that oh yeah but he he has this she has that but it's not relevant it is relevant it depends on how much people talk about this practically, obviously, if they talk about it at all, but just don't negate it. Somebody explains what they live with, don't overrule them or generalize. This is very, very important. As a person who lives with a chronic illness that's not very well researched, I know a lot about this thing. Sometimes I know more than doctors. And a lot of the times people come up to me and they are like, have you tried this? Have you tried that? And I always am like, mm -hmm, yeah, I have. I have tried this. So. I know it comes from this place of wanting to help and wanting to support people, um, but at the same time, trust people to know what they have, what they live with, to be experts in this. And this is actually something that they bring to the workplace as well. Taking hard decisions, researching, being very deliberate. These are all managerial qualities that we bring to the workplace. Try to remember without making a fuss. I always find it nice when people, for example, remember that it's easier for me to speak to the left-hand side and not to the right-hand side. So they sit themselves next to me. And this is really good because um, they, they just do, do this as if it was normal. And I highly, highly appreciate this. This is amazing um, because that way I feel so embraced, so accepted, but they're not making a big deal out of it. It's just for, for them, my normalcy is their normalcy. Asking is okay with some people, but not with others. So a lot of people, like me, for example, are very open, very outspoken. Others are not. And it's good to respect that. Ask them once you have established a relationship and respect if they don't want to talk about it at all. People with disabilities can be high performers. We have proven our weight worth in gold. We can do that. Just provide us with the right environment and you will see what we, what we will do and what we can do. And this is also the last point before I um, go to the example work with everyone to create working conditions for them to thrive in. Sometimes it's just a matter of tweaking a couple of things and you will already have a great basis for people to go forward and to do great things with. And sort of as a, as a last item in my talk, I would like to give you an example that pretty much everyone can do in the workplace. It doesn't need any technology. It doesn't need any fancy things. It's called a people manual. And a people manual is basically your own manifesto, your own description of, and I have listed some of the items, for example, how I would describe myself, what I expect of others as an in interaction and communication, as in behavior, as in culture, uh, what is important to me, so people can list their values and beliefs, their habits and rituals, but they can also say what they need to thrive at the workplace, for example, health and well-being or workplace design, so what kind of tools, what kind of setup they need. And then just to spice it up a little bit and, and add some of the interest because we're, as I said, not one dimensional. And if you have something like that and everybody fills it out, it's not the thing that only, let's say, the disabled people uh, need to do and then they will be sort of um, uh, selected for that again or singled out for that again. But have everyone fill out such a thing and then have other people, have their colleagues read that. It's, it changes a lot of things. I implemented it in two companies and it just, it makes such a difference. You learn so much about people and you also learn about people's needs even when they're not living with any kind of condition, disability or illness. You, you already, um, you create, as I said, an environment of respect where you take other people's needs, whatever they might be, into consideration. And this is just fabulous. And you can easily implement it. You only need a document. You only need a person's mind. And when those two things come together, then they can also decide what they want to write, how extensive they want to write, or if they want to keep it short. Here's an example of me uh, that I implemented at my current company, which um, again, um, in the section of health and well-being, I write some of my uh, considerations that I have. For example, that uh, there are specific situations where you cannot help me 
but, but which is fine. Uh, I will be fine after a while and I will um, ask for support if necessary. So that signals to people that no, you don't have to get into a panic mode when something happens. Maybe for allergic people, that might be the case that they need uh, um, um, emergency help. I don't uh, in that situation. So I can signal to my colleagues, what is the appropriate behavior in that situation? They can accommodate, they can support me, and we can all work together much more relaxedly. So again, to summarize my talk, there are lots and lots of tools out there. There's great technology out, of there, uh, out there to use. And I'd be happy to give you some concrete tips if there are any questions uh, on that. But the most important thing, that is your heart. Use it, embrace people, support people. And I can tell you as a person living with chronic illnesses, you will probably my dear friend for life and for all eternity. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Francisca. What an awesome talk. So I would thank like to, yeah, thank you. Um, I would like to remind everyone that you can submit questions to the Q&A tab um, and we will be very happy to read those out. Um, I will start personally by asking a question. Um, I, so I live with um, some mental illness. I have chronic depression and anxiety. Um, so I really relate to you um, talking about or, you know, just being able to talk about this. And, and um, I, I was intrigued in the beginning by how you said that you just go up front in job interviews and talk about, you know, your non-visible disabilities directly. And um, I'm 25, you know, I'm pretty young in my like career. So I would like to hear from you some tips or on how to communicate that mm. how do you yeah how do you go about that uh to be honest at 25 i also didn't communicate it in job interviews i did it afterwards <laughs> 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 i'm now 23 and i'm a people manager so i feel like i have a role model um a situation as well um how do i communicate that funnily enough with my current employer it came up in the job interview process naturally because I was talking about that I was talking about it on a stage in front of people. And uh, they were asking me, okay, so what are you talking about? I was like, yeah, disabilities and chronic illnesses. And guess what? I'm also chronically ill, um, but I'm not state recognized by the way, Lila. That's, that's also interesting because as I said, my condition is too rare and I'm still on the functioning spectrum of things. Mm. Um, so there is not, not this element of, I can have my, my, um, my certification and then my employer needs to consider other things as well. Um, so for me, just have the courage. I think courage is essential. Um, and also, I do feel that a lot of employers are not really open for that still, which is why I'm doing this advocacy, right? Um, but the more confident you are in a way, uh, the more relaxed your environment will be about this. There will always be people that might not understand, there, or at least initially, there might always be interesting questions coming up. Uh, probably you have experienced that as well. Um, but just having this open mindset and being ready to answer questions when it's necessary, when it's applicable, um, I find that it already changes a lot of things because then people are like, okay, she's not like she's, she's announcing it and then she's off, but she actually explains a little bit. So people can take my point of view. And um, also, again, if it, before I was actually doing this advocacy, I pointed towards a lot of sources as well to understand what I have just to have sort of a perspective on that. And the more people understand, the easier it is. What is foreign to you? And that is where people get insecure or might have questions on that. So again, there is no, no, no magic formula and you will probably know what is best for you, but that is a good way. And then allyship, get allyship in the company, share with a couple of people first you feel comfortable with, and then they will support you maybe in a meeting or maybe in a larger discussion, larger group setting and so forth. So this is also a very good way to go. Thank you, thank you so much. We have a question from chat, um, although I will remind you, please use the Q&A tab to submit questions, but I'll read the question. Um, so, I am wondering if you had a recommendation in how to set up the people manual in a large company. Do you think it should be digital or paper-based? Would you share it with everybody or only the team you work with? Uh, and how to introduce the idea to a company where communication can be complicated? 
I would always recommend digital because then it can be easily shared. Um, I, full disclosure, I worked at Google, so I'm a bit biased. I love Google Docs and Drive because then you can easily share things. And, and you can also edit who has access in, in which level, which is really good. Um, but there are other ways, obviously. There's intranet, there's chat, and so forth. Um, and it's obviously it's sensitive information, so you need to be able to, to delineate who you can actually share it with. Um, it depends on the company setting. If the company is very, very open, I've, I've heard from people that there are companies uh, that are very open, then I would broadly share it and be very open about that. If that is not yet the case, I would try with, as I said, allies first and then slowly maybe with the team. And I feel that an open feedback culture and open culture of respect comes even before all of that, but it can also help set that example, right? Um, so at the same time, I would I would accompany that with maybe having workshops or um, making people aware of some of the things that might not necessarily pertain to accessibility, but other realms as well, diversity, equity, inclusion, and so forth. Um, in a large company, um, decision makers need to be convinced. That is so central, especially managers higher up might have never even heard of some of the things that we are talking about today might not even be aware of right pronoun usage or um, Lina, as you mentioned, uh, taking mental days off. Uh, is, is that the wording? I hope that's not the wrong wording. Um, so just advocating inside the company with the decision makers. And what decision makers love is having stats and presentations. So find articles if you can, find support, maybe show them some of the talks that we see today. Because at the end of the day, the more diverse you are and the more open and the more welcoming you are as a company, this will affect the bottom line. A diversity always does whatever the diversity is. So having that sort of monetary um, argument uh, because people feel comfortable, then they work better, might be something that you can work with. But yeah, um, find the decision makers, find the, the people that have a say that are also influences within the company. And then um, get the probably the communications people on board, um, internal communications people to accompany that, um, to set up a strategy, uh, to uh, HR as well, HR and internal communications, they work really closely on those matters. Um, so they can also check off the boxes for anything that might be, um, might be necessary to be checked off. Um, and yeah, and, and, and get the allies, especially also in those teams, I would say. Awesome, thank you for the really in-depth response. We have another question from Tim. So first of all, thank you. Um, can you recommend any resources uh, for which decision makers and employers uh, can use uh, to start making places more accessible? So resources that can help decision makers and, and employers to start making the workplace more accessible. I'm trying to think of resources, they are actually a ton out there already. Um, I think one of my, uh, the other, other speakers has this amazing article on um, what it's like to be a blind developer, which um, just taking that perspective is generally amazing because what I might not know, I have to get acquainted with, right? But there are, there are blogs out there um, that I would recommend. Um, there are the, the, one of the best things I've ever come, came across and I've come across in the last month is the accessibility community. So um, maybe a decision maker will not go to a meetup, but with especially with the Corona situation, we are recording a lot of talks, show them the talks maybe. Um, also stats, I can only say it for Germany, but there are a lot of stats available. Um, especially on, uh, I recently researched, for example, how, which share of the population is being seen as severely disabled, which is uh, more than 50% um, in, 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 um, uh, from a status uh, point of view. So these are resources that you can also leverage. Um, and then I keep thinking back about community following people that openly live with um, things that require maybe accommodation or accessibility tools. Uh, because then you get to see their perspective and you already get it in your timeline. You don't have to proactively research for that. Also really good. Um, yeah, I think those are some of the resources that, that you can get. Um, and oh, um, that might also be very country specific, but we do have a lot of associations here that represent people with specific chronic illnesses and disabilities. So they might also have some reports, some stats. They might be able to support maybe with, um, with other resources. Um, 
in Germany, for example, there's the Deaf IT conference, uh, which has held almost every year, um, which uh, gives you access, for example, to the hard of hearing IT community. So that might also be a very good resource. I think that's about it. There's probably a lot more, but uh, we can exchange more on that afterwards. <laughs> Thank you for that. Awesome. Thank you so much.